This is episode 166 of That Shakespeare Life. fifties, when Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was adapted into West Side Story, popular culture in the U.S. resonated with gang culture and street fighting depicted on stage because the brass-knuckled rumbles taking place on streets like those in New York City were current events of the day. Turns out, historically, these gang fights were a real issue for Shakespeare's lifetime as well, and scenes like Mercutio and Romeo fighting in the streets of Verona, the mob that goes after Senna the poet in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, and the tavern brawls that break out in several scenes across Shakespeare's works would have been viewed by Shakespeare's 16th century audience as a reflection of their current events and realities on life in the streets of Elizabethan London. Here this week to help us explore the 16th century history, current events, street fights, and even the possibility of gangs that were present during Shakespeare's lifetime as he wrote about the Capulets and Montagues being warring families duking it out in the streets of Verona is our guest and expert in Elizabethan street crime and one of the Washington, D.C. area's most sought-after fight coaches for stage plays, Casey Kaliba. Casey Kaliba is a doctoral candidate in theater history and performance studies at the University of Maryland, was host and creative contributor to the two-time Emmy award-winning Experiencing Shakespeare through the Folger Library and Alabama Public Radio. A certified teacher and fight director with the Society of American Fight Directors, Casey has taught theatrical combat workshops and courses for a wide range of programs. He has taught at dozens of colleges, high schools, festivals, professional development workshops, libraries, and camps. He has served as a teaching artist for the Shakespeare Theater, Roundhouse Theater, English Speaking Union, and Folger Library. Casey has been a guest instructor for Fight Directors Canada and the Nordic Stage Fight Society, and an instructor at the Paddy Crean Workshop, the largest international stage combat workshop. Casey is a proud member of the Stage Directors and Choreographers Society, and we are delighted to have Casey visit with us today. Hello, Casey. Welcome to the show. Hey, Cassidy. It's so great to chat with you today. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the Capulets and the Montagues are described as, quote, warring families. Was this description in line with what we think of as the Hatfields and McCoys here in the U.S., or were there actually street gangs operating in Elizabethan London? Okay, so we're going to dive right in. There's, there's basically three parts to your question, and I want to address each of them because the answers are both different and unique. So the first part is about warring families. Uh, and in Shakespeare's London, especially in the 1590s, this absolutely would have been a thing. In fact, the main source of sort of urban conflict would have been between uh, competitive families that would have used their servants and their apprentices essentially as a proxy army. So it, the threat was really not from gangs um, and the idea uh, of, of sort of a roving gang of highwaymen or something like that is actually not very prevalent in Elizabethan times, believe it or not. Um, and the people who were going around, the vagrants in Elizabethan England, um, were really not threats to property or to the state. They were really largely people who were uh, migrant workers um, or who had lost work in some way or were outside of um, a family or a legal system. But the idea of gangs is not really a thing that shows up. Um, even though the plays have examples of highwaymen, you've got the disguised uh, king or, or Prince Hal and Henry IV. Um, you've got the murderers who show up in the Scottish play. But really, the threat to social order comes from these families. And the, the scholar who really digs into this is Lawrence Stone, and he's got an excellent book called The Crisis of the Aristocracy, where he really looks at this, this violence and tension in Elizabethan London really, really well. The play West Side Story adapted Romeo and Juliet and made the Capulets and Montagues into street gang families that were from the poorer side of town. However, when Shakespeare was writing the original Romeo and Juliet, where Mercutio, Tybalt, and Romeo are having sword fights on the streets of Verona, there's a class distinction that's important to recognize when evaluating these fight scenes. Casey, for Shakespeare, were there rules about what class of society you had to belong to in order to even have a sword? So I'm going to flip the answer just a little bit because you've, you've hit on it really, really well, that class is the important distinction with violence, just as it always is. So in Shakespeare, 
Shakespeare's London, there really weren't any restrictions on who could have a sword. Where the distinction really shows up is who had the right to use it and when, and who could get away with violence. So living in his lifetime, if you were an aristocrat, if you had a sir in front of your name in some way, you would have been armed. You would have had the right to bear arms and probably a historical and hereditary right to bear arms. And those are primary primarily a military right. You had weapons of war at your disposal. If you were a servant, uh, like Samson, Gregory, and Abraham in the opening of Romeo and Juliet, you also would have had the right to bear arms. And certainly at the opening of the play, we see them carrying swords and bucklers which are much lower quality, they're much cheaper, uh, they are substantially less dangerous than other swords we can talk about. And they were something that was easily available to servants. Uh, they could be purchased at stores throughout London. This was not a difficult thing to get. And it was a pretty normal thing to see servants traveling armed. And then there's a third class that you do see in the opening of Romeo and Juliet, which is sort of the aristocratic youth or the middle class youth who were unified in their carrying of what, what would become called the rapier, which was not a weapon of war. Uh, it was an urban weapon. It was smaller, thinner. Um, it was a decorative weapon. It was used to establish social status. And it was a pretty deadly object. So you have these sort of three different groups, all of whom have the right to bear arms in some capacity. Where the difference really shows up is that if you got into a fight as a servant, the person who was going to protect you was going to be the aristocratic lord, but you still might get punished for it. If you were an aristocratic lord and you got into some kind of armed conflict, which we see in the opening and all through something like Romeo and Juliet, odds are you were going to get away with it. Um, Elizabeth, uh, like many other monarchs, dispensed pardons regularly for violence and for duels. Uh, so there weren't a lot of consequences as you moved up the social stratus. So that is really where violence and class intersect in Shakespeare's lifetime. In that same scene when Mercutio and Tybalt and Romeo draw swords in the street, were they doing something recognized as illegal for 16th century London? So this is where things get really complicated. So the idea of it being illegal is a very, very vague notion because we have to understand Shakespeare's London as being fundamentally different when it comes to the whole notion of what law actually is. So to put ourselves, uh, to, to situate ourselves historically, we are before anything we would recognize as a modern police force. There are certainly sheriffs. They show up as characters in Shakespeare's plays, but they have a limited jurisdiction. Um, and often they were hired specifically by a particular town or by a particular mayor or a particular family to patrol a very set and limited area. So they're somewhere between an agent of a social uh, law, a, pu a public police force and private security guards. And they're primarily not there as prevention. They're primarily there after something has gone wrong to deal with and dispense consequences. We have uh, in Shakespeare's London really complicated systems of jurisdiction. So he moved his theater when they, when they dismantled the theater and built it as the globe on the south side of the Thames. They moved there in part because Southwark, the, the south side of the Thames River, is actually under three completely different legal jurisdictions, and none of them really wanted to take responsibility for anything. So the laws where Shakespeare was performing his plays are also pretty vague. And if you get in trouble, it's not clear who is going to come deal with it. Um, and then there's this other category, which shows up in Shakespeare's life in interesting ways, which are called liberties. And these are established buildings that were left over when uh, Henry VIII liberated property from the Catholic Church. And they really were under crown jurisdiction, but the crown didn't really care what happened in any of its particular buildings. It wasn't going to keep track of that. 
So there were places that were functionally off limits to any other jurisdiction where you could get away with things. And they had terrible reputations. Um, and, and the neighbors hated having liberties in their area because they couldn't do anything about these fencing guys who got together and were drinking and fighting and causing trouble. Um, so uh, it, it would have been unusual in Shakespeare's lifetime for uh, a fight to break out without consequences. Um, and you see that in his plays over and over again, that there's a question about witnessing. So in Romeo and Juliet, over and over, there's this idea of who's gonna see us. Um, and, and should we, and, and the big point about Romeo and Juliet that's worth considering is that Benvolio doesn't try to stop the fight in act three. He just tries to move it. He says, if we stay outside, someone's going to bust us. Let's go inside. So they're not actually trying to stop the violence. They're just trying to relocate it to a place without consequence. Shakespeare used the word rapier 31 times across his works, consistently giving the rapier and specifically the combination of rapier with a dagger to aristocratic individuals in his plays. In almost every reference to the rapier, Shakespeare refers to this weapon as my rapier or your rapier. Casey, was the rapier specifically considered a very personal weapon? You mentioned earlier that it was quite common for the everyday man to have one of these, but is this just what everyone wore? Yeah, so the key word in your question is everyday man. And we sort of have to dig into what a rapier actually was. So it doesn't show up uh, in England until about the 1540s. And it doesn't get recognized legally as a different object until about the 1560s. So in 1566, Elizabeth uh, issues a proclamation limiting the length of swords to a yard and one quarter of a yard, so about 40 inches. And she specifically in this proclamation uses the word rapier. So it was uh, recognized enough to be legally defined but what an Elizabethan audience would have thought of this is essentially a foreign weapon, uh, specifically a Spanish sword. And it gets used interchangeably in documents of the time as either a rapier or a Hispanic blade um, or a Spanish sword. That's, that's actually what it's referred to as. So the people who were sporting these, the aristocrats and the sort of the youth, the violent youth of, of Shakespeare's life are carrying an object that has got a kind of punk quality to it. Because we have to remember that for the duration of Shakespeare's lifetime, England and Spain do not have a good political or military relationship. So carrying an object that would have identified you instantly as um, not having sympathies for Spain, but sort of carrying something of the enemy would have had a kind of connotation to it that I think we miss today when we, you know, we go see a production of Shakespeare and actors just walk on stage and they have swords and they're shiny objects and they look pretty, but we, we don't get that kind of coded language. Now, wearing the sword was not enough to get you branded or kicked out of society or anything like that because they were immensely popular in England. There were both Italian and Spanish fencing instructors in London who were so popular and so good, so effective at teaching fighting that they actually helped replace the English fencing masters who had had an organization, the Masters of Defense, and it really was these Italian and French fencing masters who helped lead to the dissolution of that guild because they were not allowed to be members of it because they were, they were foreign born. They couldn't be English Masters of Defense. But what they were teaching is what the market was driving towards, how to use this faster, lighter, urban-based, fancy thing. Um, and we always get this conversation, uh, you know, what, you know, which weapon is better if there was a zombie apocalypse, which sword would you like to have? You know, is an English sword better than a Spanish rapier? And certainly these debates were going on in Shakespeare's lifetime, and there isn't really a good advantage. There are different tools that performed different tasks. Um, 
English swords were really, really good at making you into two of you. And Spanish swords <laughs> were really, really good at putting holes inside of you. Um, and we can have a debate about which one of those was more survivable or which one of those you'd rather have happen to you. I'm going to go um, with holes being easier <laughs> to survive than two of me. And, and that's possible. Um, so the other thing we have to remember is that if we read between the lines, a lot of people were carrying rapiers, but they don't necessarily know how to use them. They're, they're sort of fashion accessories because there's a whole market of fencing instructors who get hired on the day of the duel or the week of the duel to really, really, really quickly train these aristocratic boys in how to use a sword or they would rent out specifically longer swords. So on the day of the fight, you had a one foot advantage. And that actually shows up in the plays as well. In Afra Bain's The Rover, there's a duel or, or a kind of a brawl that's about to start between these two gangs of people. And it stopped because the one group of guys realizes that the other group of guys has Spanish swords. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Their swords are too long, let's stop this fight. And so it doesn't even happen. And so to go back to Elizabeth's proclamation, she's trying to limit Spanish swords to be closer to the length of English swords so that the sort of that advantage disappears. But a rapier would have been an absolutely common sight in Shakespeare's London. It's nice to know that Shakespeare was considering questions like which weapon to use for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> I, I, that just raises Shakespeare's reputation in my estimation. Excellent. And and the rapier kind of looks to me like the the climbing bracelets of today when you're talking about carrying it around as a fashion <laughs> accessory. My my boys have these like climbing rope bracelets that they wear around all the time, and I think you will have no idea what to do with that if, right. if you you know needed it. So that's I think that's a fair comparison. And I know that you've told us before that dueling was something that you could get away with if you were an upper class citizen. But as I understand it, dueling for Shakespeare's lifetime was strictly speaking illegal, despite how many times we see it used as a plot device in Shakespeare's plays. I think it was actually pretty normal behavior. But Casey, when it comes to the British judicial system during Shakespeare's mm -hmm. lifetime, which you've mentioned is kind of way different from what we think of it today, I wonder about trial by combat. Was that still in place and how did that conflict with the laws prohibiting dueling? Yeah, so there's a central paradox in this question, which is that dueling was absolutely illegal, but you almost always got away with it if you were the surviving party. So pardons were dispensed by Elizabeth, by James I, by French monarchs, by Spanish monarchs, German monarchs. So for people who engaged in dueling, it absolutely was against the law, but these proclamations also needed to be reissued every couple of decades. Um, and there had been anxiety about giving permission to private citizens to settle conflict. And this anxiety goes back all the way to the 13th century. So Edward I is the first to sort of say that there will be no fencing instructors in the city of London. So we don't want private citizens learning how to use swords on their own. That's a problem. If you're going to learn how to use a sword, you, you should be part of the military. You should be of service to the state. But in his proclamation from, uh, from the 13th century, he immediately says, but you can have a fencing school in, uh, in another kind of property. So it is OK as long as it's not these kinds of houses. So immediately there's this sort of vague, where can you and where can't you have a fencing school? The idea of trial by combat is really interesting because it goes in and out of fashion. And for a very long time, it is sanctioned by the church. And one of the places that you can go to have a trial by combat is actually a church property. It's a church yard where they would set up exhibition stands and they would have crowds and they would be specifically set up and equipped with the weapons and the judges and the rules to do this. And they would use biblical precedent that David and Goliath settled a conflict through trial by combat. So there is biblical precedent for doing this. Over time, 
uh, and we're talking about a lot of centuries here. So, so this is not a quick transition. The church starts to become a little less uh, comfortable with the idea of sanctioning interpersonal violence. And of course, this coincides with a sort of centralization of power into the monarchy um, and a sort of transition of power and, and the authority to use force towards the monarchy. Is this the same same time around about as the rise of the Anabaptists and the pacifist sort of movement? Yes. Okay. So we are and, and we are going to, you know, we are going to cross over the, the, the Protestant Reformation in here as well, where, you know, the questions about who has the right to use force, who has the right to use violence, who can administer death is really going to become uh, an interesting philosophical and very practical question. So trial by combat really does disappear before Shakespeare's lifetime. So he is not dealing with it. Um, you do start to have the beginning of a judicial system in which if you have a complaint against someone else, there is someone you can go ask. There is a magistrate, there is a court. So the idea of settling things with personal violence uh, really does disappear uh, for some things. If you insult someone's sister, if you uh, insult someone's honor, that is absolutely going to be something that you do solve on a personal level. So, and honor, we need to kind of understand as a sort of currency that some people have access to it, some people do not have access to it. Um, it really is an economy that runs through in, uh, a sort of an English lifetime. Um, and, it, and this is true whether you're in France or Spain or England or Germany or Japan or anywhere else where honor becomes uh, a sort of guiding central principle in a society. So much about the early American West makes more sense when you understand what they were coming from. Yes. Absolutely. And this idea of sort of honor as a commodity, right? And you see this in the Iliad, right? That, um, you know, uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon are being asked to give up prizes, whether they're people or their armor, and they have to replace the honor that they lose by taking someone else's honor. So, uh, they lose one uh, trophy of war, and so they take one from Achilles, and this makes Achilles angry, and it becomes the sort of central conflict that runs through the first half of the Iliad is sort of honor as a, as a currency, and that's one of the reasons why dueling was often pardoned, um, that if you won, there was this idea that you had preserved your honor within a society and a certain, a certain level of society that recognized honor as social currency, and so you were right because you'd won you had preserved your honor. Now, that may not actually have anything to do with the truth uh, about what you had done to start the fight, but if you'd won, you, you'd gotten a couple of honor points, if we want to think about that. Um, so it certainly was illegal, um, and there were crackdowns time and time again. Dueling was illegal. But Elizabeth doesn't seem to have cared very much, um, other than her proclamation from 1566 about the length of swords. She really didn't interfere with dueling at all. Um, James I does crack down on dueling, but we should remember that he had a sort of vested interest in regulating violence around himself, um, right? He'd survived at least the 1605 gunpowder plot. He knew that there were people trying to kill him. Um, so the idea that he might have been anxious about who was carrying swords and using them um, maybe helps understand why he was a little antsy about dueling. In the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, you mentioned that the servants come out with these swords and bucklers and that for an Elizabethan audience, that was a recognizable prop that would have meant something to them in terms of the value of the weapons that they're carrying and it being appropriate to a servant. But is there anything that we could tell about the servants when they appear on stage as far as what they were doing when they show up with these particular weapons? Yeah, so this is something that gets lost to modern audiences all the time. And part of it is the way we stage Shakespeare today. So I've done 40 something productions of Romeo and Juliet as a fight director. And every production wants to do it a little bit differently. They'll set it in a different historical time period. They'll set it, uh, you know, 
Um, they'll costume it a little bit differently. And so the weapons always change. Um, I've done it with canes and straight razors. I've done it with historically accurate props. I've done it set in modern times. Um, I've done all sorts of different versions. But for Shakespeare's audience, when Samson, Samson, Gregory, and Abraham come on the stage with swords and bucklers, the London audience, and specifically the London audience, would have recognized those objects very specifically. Because the sword and buckler were something used by servants recreationally on Sundays. So they would go to a place uh, on the outskirts of London proper called Smithfield, which was just a great big field, one of the many fields where they would have market days, where they would have social events, where the military would drill and do formation training. And it was also a big open field where you could you know, just like Central Park today, you can go and have a picnic, you can go and play Frisbee. And one of the really, really popular things to do on a weekend was to go with your buddies, with your sword and your buckler, and to go knock each other around for a couple of hours, which tells us a couple of things. The first is that these weapons were not the deadly rapier, right? That you could actually go with your buddies, hit each other with these, make a lot of sound, make a lot of noise, but not really hurt each other. Um, you might sting each other a bit. You, you're gonna come home with some bruises, but you're gonna have a good time. These are not weapons that are instantly going to kill you. Um, there is uh, an athletic culture that is built around kind of the sport aspect of fighting. So these guys aren't training for the military and they're not necessarily uh, looking for self-defense training. This is just a skill and an activity that lower and uh, sort of lower middle class men in Elizabethan London would have done. And there's some argument that you can actually date the days of the play in Romeo and Juliet, you can actually build a timeline because Samson, Gregory, and Abraham, when they walk on stage, would have been presumably going to Smithfield um, or the audience would have recognized that that's where these guys are heading. And so the play begins on a Sunday because that's the day that in, in Shakespeare's London, people would have gone to play in the park. In Julius Caesar, a mob goes after Senna the poet. For Shakespeare, was a mob chasing after someone considered delinquent behavior or more in line with like a citizen's arrest? So mobs are really fascinating in Shakespeare and they show up over and over again. And I think one of the things you see in Shakespeare is uh, a fascination with violence, uh, a, a great discomfort with violence and how quickly it can get out of control. Now, the thing about mobs in Shakespeare's London is that he would have been intimately familiar with them. So in the years leading up to writing Romeo and Juliet, presumably in 1595, there were a series of riots in London around food scarcity. There were a couple of bad harvests, and particularly in the city, food became very, very expensive, and it became very, very scarce. And this led to a lot of mob-driven um, violence and sort of mob-driven social force. So crowds of people would go to bakers, for example, and demand that they lower their prices. Um, and this was sanctioned, that this was okay in Elizabethan London, as long as it didn't really spread too far. And there really was this idea that, that the mob represented a kind of democratic will, and that if you were going to protest the price of bread or grain, that that was actually a legitimate social function and a kind of financial corrective. It, it helped keep the bakers honest. So things like that could get out of control, and they certainly did. There was mob violence. It sometimes got too far that the crown would step in, um, and, and the crown or the state was often disproportionate in its use of force towards mobs, but the mob would have been a presence in Shakespeare's life. I think one of the things you see in the plays is an anxiety, an anxiety about how quickly a mob can turn. So certainly in Julius Caesar, we have this beautiful speech by Mark Antony where he talks about uh, the body of Julius Caesar and what Caesar meant to the Roman people. And then immediately after that, 
the mob that has been whipped up by this very, very famous speech that we kind of recognize as beautiful rhetoric, the mob gets gets sort of whipped up into a frenzy and, and, and they, they kill Sin of the Poet really arbitrarily. And I think one of the things Shakespeare is talking to us uh, about there is the idea that you are what the mob makes you. So if Mark Antony can convince the mob that Caesar was a martyr, then he can whip the mob up onto his side of things. If Brutus can convince the mob that Caesar was a tyrant, the mob will go that way. And in the case of Sin of the Poet, he doesn't even get to defend himself. He is what the mob decides that he is. Uh, and you know that final line, tear him for his bad verses. He is what the mob wants him to be. You see this in Richard III as well, uh, where Richard III goes out uh, and, and has his sort of fake presentation before the mob, and he's got his clack of followers in the crowd sort of cheering on and, and, and presenting his side and, and making him into this sort of figure. And he is what the mob makes him to be. So we have this narrative of state power that comes to us um, from people who tell the history of the state, that governments are able to tamp down crowds, that um, the mob is able to be suppressed. And you see this in the Franco Zeffirelli, Romeo and Juliet. And it's a really fascinating moment where in that opening fight scene, everybody's killing each other in the marketplace. And then the prince's horses ride in and he says, everybody be quiet. And everybody sort of kneels down. And, so, and there's even a shot of Lord Capulet and Lord Montague kind of you know, shush, shush, everybody do what the prince says. And I think what's important is that that is not in the play, right? In the actual play, the prince comes in and four lines in, he says, will they not listen, right? Will they not hear? Like, Yeah, he's totally he has, ignored. <laughs> yeah, he has no authority. And all through Romeo and Juliet, you see the authority of the state ignored, right? No one will stop fighting when he shows up until he threatens them with violence. No one listens to his proclamation about dueling. They just say, yeah, we'll go inside. And even at the end, his authority can't really do anything to prevent either mob violence, the aristocratic violence between families, or the duels between these you know, teenagers, or the death of these children. An entire generation is wiped out, and Prince Aeschylus just sits there and watches. So we have this narrative of, of state authority. But the last thing I want to say about mobs is that they had power too. And you see all of these accounts of a prisoner who was just put in stocks or something like that, but the crowd turned on them and they would actually end up killing a prisoner uh, in public, even though that wasn't their punishment. We find the opposite, that people would be paraded through town because they'd committed some crime and the mob you know, would say, no, we're on their side. And they would tear down the scaffold or they would pull them off the wagon. And there wasn't much that a magistrate or a sheriff or the authority of the crown could do against a crowd of thousands. So they often just let it happen. And you find this in executions as well, where there, you know, people were allowed to give a final speech to the crowd as part of their, you know, as part of an execution. And very often they could sway the crowd to their side. It was a dangerous thing, the, the force of a mob. And I think Shakespeare over and over sort of puts the crowd into his plays in really fascinating ways. So let's take a look at this idea of honor behind things like dueling and violence in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet and Laertes duel at the end using rapier and dagger specifically. There's a great deal of history behind that specific style mm -hmm. of fighting that we've covered on our show before. So I will link to that history in the show notes for today's episode so you can explore that. But Casey, I want to ask you about the poison on Laertes' sword. If the duel was intended to be this honorable fight, presumably in which one of the two men would be dead at the duel, conclusion, what is the historical significance of the poison? How would an Elizabethan audience have viewed the poison blade in context of their understanding and acceptance of a duel? The fight at the end of Hamlet is a really complicated thing. On the one hand, it's probably Shakespeare's, uh, one of his most famous fight scenes, um, but there's a lot going on there. So 
the first thing I want to say is using the word dual to describe it, um, we have to be a little elastic about what that word actually means. Um, Hamlet knows he's been challenged and knows that there is a wager on this. And there's a line in Hamlet about baited blades. Hamlet's expectation going into that fight, this prearranged challenge between Hamlet and Laertes, is that it is not going to be to the death, right? So he has questions about baited blades. Um, there are questions about whether the blades have all a length. Um, so it is a duel in the sense that it is prearranged um, and it is it is meant to sort of settle a, a, an argument between these two guys. But Hamlet's expectation doesn't seem to be at any point that he's going to die on that day. He has that great scene with uh, with um, Horatio where Horatio says, you know, you know, this is a trick, right? And Hamlet says, yes, I know it's a trick, but I don't know what the trick is and I've got to see it through. And he doesn't know, you, you know, until uh, until Laertes actually tells him what's gone wrong. Hamlet has no idea what has happened. Um, so he has, I think, an expectation that he'll come out of this very differently. And certainly the fight starts with him apologizing to Laertes to kind of clear the air. He, he wants them to meet as equals fairly in a kind of honest competition. When we get to the poison, and poison shows up throughout Shakespeare, um, it absolutely was a thing that audiences were aware of as a plot device. Um, and uh, and I think when you look at Hamlet, what you have to see when we look at the poison is Shakespeare kind of flips the plot of the play at the, in the last scene and digs really deep into the revenge tragedy conventions. So he steers away from conversations about honor and he steers away from conversations about sort of the rightness or the legality of what is happening and digs back into sort of letting the plot close with this idea of righteous vengeance. Um, and so this poison would have rhymed with other poison moments from other revenge tragedies. Um, the Revengers tragedy is going to be a couple of years later, 1607, uh, but it certainly has poison throughout it. The Spanish tragedy is another thing we could look at. Um, the one point about honor that I think we really ought to look at with Hamlet is that Hamlet, as we all know, has opportunities to kill Claudius, the most famous being the prayer scene, and he doesn't. And there's lots of uh, articles and thoughts and think pieces about why Hamlet doesn't kill Claudius. Um, it is dishonorable to stab a man in the back. He doesn't want to do it while Claudius is praying because he's worried that he might go to heaven. Um, an audience might be sort of cheated out of the satisfaction of a kind of big conflict between Claudius and Hamlet uh, because he just, you know, gets stabbed while he's kneeling. And Shakespeare manages to write a version of the play in which the, the final moment where Hamlet enacts his revenge and kills Claudius is wholly righteous. Um, Hamlet is completely in the right because of the death of his mother, because of the treachery of Laertes. And we have to remember that it is Laertes' idea to poison the sword. Claudius wants to poison the drink. So there's these two poison plots, um, all of which go wrong. And so Hamlet at that last moment is responding to the individual treachery of Laertes, masterminded by Claudius the domestic treachery of, of Claudius in the, the, the accidental death of his mother, the political treachery of Claudius of killing his father and, and, the, and the personal slight there. And so all of these revenges come together in this beautiful moment where he has the double kill, where he, he stabs Claudius and then forces him to drink the poison. So everything kind of comes back together in a way that makes creative writing teachers so excited. It's that perfect kind of full circle wholeness. So we've talked about warring families and fencing being extremely popular as well as duels being arranged and happening anyway but i wonder 
for someone like Shakespeare, who as a man was reasonably considered part of the middle class during portions of his life, I wonder what it would have been like for him to just walk down the street in Elizabethan London. Casey, if a man was just walking from one place to another, was it common for him to have to navigate around or avoid some kind of random brawls that might break out without warning? Or were all of these fights, duels, and challenges of honor held in places like these churchyards you mentioned, where they have a, you know, no, we're going to fight here? Or, or was it just happening everywhere? So there's a couple of things we really have to um, understand about Shakespeare's lifetime that's very, very different than our own. The first is that there is a fundamentally different relationship between people living in Shakespeare's lifetime and death than there is today. You, if you were living in Shakespeare's lifetime, would have been intimately familiar with violence and death in a way that we no longer are. If you lived to survive your own childhood, you would most likely have witnessed the death of a younger sibling. If you lived long enough to have children, you would almost certainly have had a child die, which of course happens to uh, Shakespeare and Anne Hathaway. You would have seen people die in executions, in punishments. Um, family members would have lived in close quarters. And when somebody was sick, you would have seen them be sick and die. Um, th there's a, a great point that gets made uh, in The American Way of Death, that classic book, that there's this transformation of space where we go from the largest room of a house being a parlor with easy access to the front door because you need a place to put dead bodies in your house that you can get them in and out. And that's why funeral parlors are called parlors because they, they take this domestic space. And when that room was taken out of the American household, it was relabeled the living room, a room for the living. But in Shakespeare's lifetime, people would have died in your house. You would have seen that process and you would have taken care of the body. And if you were traveling through the streets of London, you would have, over the course of your lifetime, encountered violence. You, were, you would most likely have seen someone be stabbed. You would certainly have seen a bar fight of some kind. Um, you could have seen prize fights where uh, fencing instructors and students would have challenged each other. Um, you would have seen the military drilling at places like Spitalfields. Um, so you would have seen a sort of constant presence of death and violence. But the second thing we have to sort of uh, think about is the idea that this sort of bumper sticker idea that we have today, that an armed society is a polite society. And the evidence is absolutely that that's garbage. Um, and certainly in Shakespeare's lifetime, an armed society meant a more dangerous society. Um, people were carrying weapons. The famous quote that gets pulled from Hollinshed all the time about this from Hollinshed's Chronicles is seldom do you see a man above 18 or 20 years without a dagger at least at his side. Almost everybody is traveling armed in some way. Um, they might have secret weapons around them. Uh, you see that in, in Romeo and Juliet. It's a moment that actually gets lost a lot, which is that Juliet has a dagger hidden by her bedside. Like, she believes she is threatened in her bedroom and has a weapon there. Um, Lady Capulet, when she's trying to console Juliet after the death of Tybalt, says, I've got an idea. Let's hire an assassin and send him to Mantua to kill Romeo. There is a presence of violence and an armed population that was not regulated by any police force, was not regulated by a judicial system that had a lot of room to accommodate personal uh, quarrel. Um, this is a society where the threat to society and, and to status is not really coming from people outside of society. It's not rogues and vagabonds. It's not uh, vagrants and, uh, and roaming gangs of people. The biggest threat to society is society itself. It's these aristocrats who are fighting amongst themselves. It is the state imposing violence on citizens. Um, you are more likely to be a victim of that than a, a random robber, but you would have experienced violence. And certainly, you know, in Shakespeare's very, very curious will, um, 
right? He actually gives away his sword. He has a sword as part of his property. His actors had swords, even though they were sort of an outside lower class, right? They're grouped with prostitutes and vagabonds. But in that great anecdote where uh, they dismantle the theater and, you know, in that December, those three nights in December, they, they move it across the River Thames and rebuild the globe. In that anecdote, they talk about how they were armed as they did that. So they're carrying pikes and swords and things like that as they travel the streets of London to protect the theater, the wood, and themselves. There's an inequality of punishment. If you're an aristocrat, you're probably going to get away with things. And if you're lower class, you're probably going to get punished in some way. But the third point I want to make about violence in Shakespeare's lifetime and how common it would be is that we need to be kind of responsible about what history actually tells us. So in a movie like Shakespeare in Love or a, a film adaptation of Shakespeare, people are constantly tripping over fights, right? These, these fights spill out of taverns and, you know, a room with a view has got this great knife fight in the piazza. And certainly those things would have happened. Certainly in your lifetime, you would have come across this. Um, ben Johnson is involved in a fight with one of his actors. Christopher Marlowe very famously is set upon by two strangers in a tavern in Deptford. But the fact that these things happened doesn't tell us much about how common they were. So uh, Henslow in his diary talks about how he only hosted one prize fight in his entire life in one of his theaters. And we know that the prize fights between the fencing masters actually did not happen in theaters and they did not happen very frequently. Um, there was never one in the globe. There's really only one reference in the rows. Um, these were not common in theaters and they weren't particularly common outside of that. So when Henslow hosts one, it looks a lot more like a favor to someone and a lot less like a pattern of behavior. Samuel Pepys, writing a couple of decades later, only talks about two prize fights. And, and he's, you know, he's secretary of the Navy, but he only goes in his diary to two in his entire life. So these actually weren't that common. There's an amazing study that was done over of, of traveling entertainers, because we really need to think about uh, theater, not just in London, but through the whole of England. And in the 90 years that bookend Shakespeare's career, there is exactly one traveling entertainer who was a swordsman. So it's possible that you didn't need that kind of entertainment because every town had its own fencing instructor. But the market for swords as entertainment actually seems to be smaller than we think. The statistic that always gets tossed out when you think about fencing is that, uh, you know, earlier in fence in dueling's history, uh, there's a, a sort of 20 year span in France where 4000 aristocrats are killed in duels. And, and that's a staggering number that, that really is a lot of people. But in Shakespeare's life, that number drops to the hundreds. Um, in, in terms of sheer number of duels. So, you know, over large spans of time, there really are not that many recorded events. So they certainly did happen. And death was a constant in Shakespeare's life. But the idea that you would just see a sword fight every single day, or this was something that was very, very common, I think we need to be really suspicious uh, of that narrative. And I think we need to be really careful about what the historical evidence actually tells us about how common these events were. I know we would love to learn more about this topic. What are some of your favorite books or resources you can recommend we use to learn more? Yeah, there's a couple, and I'm gonna kind of go through, uh, I'm gonna look at three really quickly, and they are in sort of increasing uh, degrees of wonkiness. 
So, <laughs> All very, right, here we go. <laughs> so probably um, the most fun read and the most sort of conversational read um, is a book called By the Sword, a history of gladiators, musketeers, samurai, swashbucklers, and Olympic champions. And that's by Richard Cohen. And it's a really, really nice, extraordinarily well-researched study of sort of swords in culture. Um, and he covers a lot of different topics and a lot of different cultures. It's very readable. It's very enjoyable. Um, the second book gets a little bit more detailed, but a little bit more specific. And that is a hefty hardbound book called The Martial Arts of Renaissance. Europe by Sidney Anglo. This is a very, very readable book, but it is about a very small topic, and it really is um, sort of, uh, it digs really, really deep into the research. Um, so it's a very, very readable book if you want to know about martial culture from the late Middle Ages uh, into Shakespeare's lifetime in the Renaissance throughout all of Europe. And it's a really, really good survey of that and is, and is really the definitive text on the subject. The last one, there's lots of academic papers and essays and articles and monographs and all sorts of things about sword play in Shakespeare. Uh, my own thoughts as a historian is that we have to take some of them with a grain of salt and we ought to rethink some of those conclusions with new evidence. Um, but the one that I really like because it, it pulls back and looks at the bigger picture um, is Shakespeare and Violence. And this is uh, published by Cambridge Press and it's by R.A. Folks. And it's a really excellent look at sort of the microcosm of things like dueling and how they function in Hamlet. It pulls back and looks at sort of military violence in the history plays. It looks at things like revenge and honor and class. And, and it is a very academic footnote heavy book, but it's a really, really good look at sort of the global perspective of how Shakespeare interacts with violence. Now, I do want to offer one tiny little caveat, and I think we sort of have to keep this in mind when we look at Shakespeare and violence, which is that a lot of the books written about swordplay and violence and Shakespeare and fencing and dueling are written by people who have an interest in that. They are fencers or they are military historians. And so they come at the material as people who are fans of and in favor of uh, or interested in interpersonal violence and fencing and swordplay and the history of all of that. And I think that sometimes that leaves us with a with a, a, a critical or an academic blind spot, which is into the actual ethics and the morality of what we're looking at. A lot of authors will give you really, really good stories about, uh, you know, a fun, uh, here's, a, here's a fun story about a duel, and here's a, a really funny story about people who stabbed each other a lot. And I think we, we have an ethical obligation, especially when we're dealing with Shakespeare, to step back and look at the bigger picture. Who has the right to use violence? Who do they have the right to use violence on? Who are the victims of this violence? How is this violence being used to structure society? And how are power structures of a society, whether they are race or class or gender, how does violence fit into that matrix? And a lot of books and essays and articles about Shakespeare and swordplay go really, really deep into the fencing manuals. They go really, really deep into the prize fights uh, or the, the relationship between the fencing school at Blackfriars and the Burbage family. And they don't always step back and look at the sort of the role of violence in a society and who has access to it. And I think that's something that's brilliant about Shakespeare is that he does. He absolutely covers the whole range of human violence. He, is, uh, he shows it as heroic. He shows it as beautiful. He shows it as brutal. He shows it as domestic. He shows it as military. He shows us good kings and bad kings. He shows us uh, you know, murderers with a conscience and murderers who have no problem, you know, drowning people. Um, he shows us teenagers who can't wait to stab people and teenagers who struggle with the fact that they feel guilt about things. Um, he shows us really a complete 
tapestry of human responses to violence, where we can see ourselves reflected back both positively and negatively. And I think that's a really powerful thing about what he does as a playwright. Which are ultimately the same exact questions Elizabethan London was asking about violence. So it seems the questions haven't changed that much in 400 years. (laughs) No, not at all. (laughs) We ask everyone this next question here at That Shakespeare Life, and that's, what's the one book you would take with you on a deserted island? My friends in England tell me I'm supposed to allow you the complete works of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible, so your choice would be in addition to those. So this is a funny question because this podcast will be listened to years from now when we're no longer in a pandemic and have been shut up in our houses for 15 months because we have all been kind of living this question for the last right? year. Yeah. The we all have our own little island. <laughs> yes, we've all been on a desert island and we found out exactly what movies we would watch when we were stuck. Um So uh, the example I would choose, um, this is a very difficult question. Um, The example I would actually pick is the complete poems of Kenneth Rexroth, um, who is a mid-century American poet uh, who I like very much. And the way I tried to answer this question was, if I was gonna be stuck on that desert island, I know that I would go through a lot of different thoughts and moods. And I know that I would go into my head and out of my head and I would come to peace with things and struggle with things. And I wanted to have as a companion, a poet who also went through a sort of many different moods and talked about many different things and talked about what was lost and what was available and how to make the most out of your presence where you were. And so Kenneth Rexroth, I think is the poet for me at least who would be a good companion on that island. I think you would be well set up on your deserted <laughs> island and you you did well with your practice you've had here for <laughs> living on deserted islands. So what's next for you? What are you working on now that you're excited about? Yeah, so theaters are starting to get rolling again um, after the as the pandemic winds down. Um, and uh, obviously the fights in plays were not anybody's priority uh, as we've done Zoom theater over the last year. Um, so a lot of us are, are kind of getting back to work. Um, I've got a couple of projects coming up in the fall that I'm pretty excited about, one of which is a retelling of Don Quixote um, called Quixote Nuevo. Um, And the Don Quixote story was contemporary to Shakespeare, uh, so it does tie into our conversation, and I'm really looking forward to playing with that. Um, I've got a Robin Hood coming up that I'm really looking forward to because I just want to have some fun with something, Um, and something sprightly and swashbuckly sounds like an enormous amount of fun. Absolutely. Well, I am happy for you that you're getting back to work and getting to go and do these. I know that will be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Casey, for being here and talking with us about this topic. This has been a really great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really great to chat with you. Make sure to visit the show notes for today's episode, where we've linked you to the film versions that Casey mentions today, along with quotes from the plays that demonstrate street fighting and a few archival images that will help you see some of the fighting styles he talked about, like rapier and dagger, and even some more archival information on Elizabethan duels and her proclamation from 1566, all kinds of little extras. We've packed that along with the books and resources Casey mentions into the show notes for today. So make sure you jump over there to find all of those things. You'll find the show notes at Cass cassidycash.com slash episode 166. That's cassidycash.com slash EP 166. That's it for this week. Thank you for being here. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. 